Now, first thing I'm going to say is, if you missed last week, and you, you, you might not understand what today's title is about. Right? This, this message today is titled, But It's Not. But It's Not. And to refresh your memory, even if you were here last week and you, maybe you've forgotten, uh, as we were working through chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians last week, there's a section where uh, all of chapter 15, Paul has been talking about uh, the gospel and the resurrection. And last week he, he approached the resurrection, what we studied, he approached the resurrection from the standpoint of if the resurrection is false. If the resurrection is false, then there's this, this, and this, and several things we talked about. And as we pick up in verse 20 today and through the end of the chapter, he's, he's, he's going back and he's saying, tie it back to last week. If the resurrection is false, but it's not. Okay? So that's where, where, where we're coming from today. The fact is, the resurrection is not false. It's not a false thing. And, and he affirms that in, in the passage of scripture that we'll study today. Uh, he, he's affirming the fact that the resurrection is a real thing. It is not false. It is something we can trust. We can believe. We can build a theology on it. We can, we can build belief and faith on the fact of the resurrection. So that's what we'll study today. And starting out, we'll just read verse 20. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful indeed for the truth of the resurrection. Grateful, Father, that that we, we can believe it as truth, uh, that we do believe it as truth. In, in fact, I, I hope, I pray that for all of the people here, if not most of the people, God, that, that, we, that we do, in fact, believe this to be truth, this resurrection. It's what our, our faith rests on it, God. And so I pray that, uh, that we can understand it well and be able to explain it well to to people who maybe struggle with believing that or haven't been introduced to it yet. Uh, as we go through this scripture passage today, Father, I pray that our eyes will be opened uh, to, uh, to be able to apply this better in our own walk with you, but then importantly, God, to be able to communicate this to people who aren't walking with you yet so that you will be honored and you will be glorified in it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So then, first thing we're going to see here is that, as we're talking about the fact that the resurrection is not false, is that Jesus Christ himself is prime evidence of the resurrection. Now, way back at the beginning of chapter 15, Paul talked about all the evidence that Jesus was resurrected after the crucifixion. Saw so all the witnesses and the testimony to the fact that Jesus is alive. He was resurrected from the grave after the crucifixion. And then in verse 20 he says that, that Christ in particular is he is the first fruits of those who are asleep. So he is evidence of resurrection and he's the first fruits of this. And, and what does he mean by this? There, there's two things that, that we want to get to here is that first of all he, he's first in rank. He's first in eminence. He's preeminent if you will of all those who will be Resurrected, And we'll get into, into who will be resurrected as we go throughout the scripture. But what we see here is a promise that if he's, the, if he's the first fruits of resurrection, then what does that lead you to believe? That there must be more to come, right? There, are going to be, there, there will be more resurrections to come. There will be more people who are resurrected. So he is, he is first in rank. He, he's he's the, the, the top there is of, of who will ever be resurrected. He's preeminent among all of those, and he's first in number. He's the first one to be resurrected. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, I, I know I've read in the Bible about other people who are resurrected, and, and some of them even before Jesus. You know, you, uh, Elijah and Elisha, you know, raised some people from the dead, and uh, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. You know, weren't they resurrected? Well, you could say they were resurrected, but guess what? They died again. They died again. They, they were raised from the dead only to die again. 
The difference that we're talking about here is that the resurrection we're speaking of, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Jesus didn't die again. He is still alive. When you and I are resurrected, we won't die again. We will live for eternity. So it's important that we understand, understand that when we're talking about Jesus being the first fruits. Then as we continue on working through verses uh, 21 through 26, uh, we're going to see some about the, the order and, and resurrection, uh, order to death and resurrection. Verse 21 says, For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, uh, when he has established all rule and authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. So a couple things we see going on here when we're talking about uh, the order to death and resurrection. And, and Paul goes back to and, and uses this, this, this contrast, kind of a compare and contrast between Adam and Jesus. And even over in verse 44, uh, verse 45, it says, So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And so we see here this compare and contrast that he's using between the first Adam, Adam, and the second Adam, if you will, Jesus Christ. He, he's, he's using uh, some, some privilege there to refer to Jesus as the second Adam. And, and, and what he's doing here is, is, is seeing, is, is helping you, is he's doing that so we can compare and see what goes on with these two. Uh, the first Adam, the one that, that God created here. Uh, God created him and he ended up being a, a life taker. He ended up being a life taker because of his sin, because of his sin of, of, of eating from the tree that he shouldn't eat from. And yes, that, that's on him, uh, not just on Eve, it's on him because he stood there and watched her do it and didn't stop it, okay? So, uh, and, and from that came death. From that came death and sickness and everything we have to deal with in this world. Once they did that, comes all this stuff, you know, tornadoes and earthquakes and all. Everything was just unbound as a result of that. Death. Death. That's a life taker. But then the second Adam, Jesus Christ, is a life giver. He's a life giver. And he's a life giver because of the fact and truth of resurrection. Because death couldn't hold him, death couldn't contain him, he raised from the dead to live forever. He is a life giver, not just to himself, but to those who Believe this is, this is the good, good promise and the good, good truth of the second Adam, of Jesus Christ, the life giver. Important little side note here. Because Jesus is a life giver, guess who else should be life givers? You and me. You and me, all believers. We should be life givers. We should be breathing life into each other. We should be breathing life into this community that we live in. And church, you do a good job of that. Church, you could do a, a, a very good job of, of, of attempting anyway to breathe life into this community. The way that you respond to the different calls for food, for money, for donations, that's, that's an attempt on, on your part to, to breathe life, to give life to the community. The way that you respond to the JV football ministry and feeding these young men is an attempt to give life to be a life giver to this community. So it's important that we know that, important that we remember that. Now, also interesting in this, in this section of the scripture, Paul starts communicating, um, I guess the ultimate, we will call it the ultimate hope and promise of resurrection. Because he starts talking about uh, eschatology, the, the, the last things. He starts talking about what is to come here. And, and he spends a lot of time on that in, in, this, in, this, in this whole section of Scripture that we're studying today. He, he's pointing the reader, he's pointing the, the, the church at Corinth, he's pointing, pouring, pointing my mind and your mind 
to the, the last days, to, to final things, to get us starting to think about what's going to happen when, what's going to happen in eternity, what's that going to look like? And, and, and he says here, but in, in verse 23, each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming. So he's talking about Christ, Christ's return, his second coming. And so Christ will be the, the first resurrected, and when he comes back, all those who have died in Christ will be will be resurrected at that point. Uh, verse 24, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father uh, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. And here he's pointing us to uh, the, the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign. And, and it's after that thousand year reign that he, that he kind of hands that kingdom over to the Father to rule for eternity. Uh, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that we will be abolished is death. And, and, and we're po being pointed to the fact here, uh, what I believe he's pointing us to, is the, 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 abolish, uh, about the ultimate abolishment of death is when Satan is thrown into that lake of fire. And, 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 and those unbelievers. And, and so the second judgment, if you will. This is what he's talking about here and, and, and getting to the order uh, of death and resurrection and then the things to come as a result of resurrection. Down in verses uh, 27 and 28, we're going to see kind of continuing the same thought, but because of his resurrection, all things are subject to him. This is very interesting uh, what we get into here. Verse 27 says, For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he, he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also would be sub subjected to the one who subjected all things to him so that God may be all in all. And boy, you read that and you're like, who, is, who are all these hymns that we're talking about? Him is subjected to him and it's under his feet and under his feet. Who, who, what in the world are we talking about here? Okay, so... What we're understanding is that uh, we, we got to have the Godhead in view here. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And, and what we understand is that God the Son, Jesus, is, it will, things will be uh, made subject to him. Everything, it says, will be made subject to him. But not the one who made everything subject to him. Okay? So what we're getting at here is that God the Father is ultimately in control, has that authority to put everything in subjection under the feet of God the Son, Jesus Christ. Okay? That does not mean that God the Father is subject to God the Son. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, there's, there's no order, of, there's no uh, pecking rank here, there, there's no pecking order, if you will, there, there's no rank, they are equal. They are equal. But in their equality and in the, the distinct roles that each of them has, there, there, are, there are times and moments of, of subjection, if you will, of being subject to. God the Son submits to the will of the Father in carrying out the plan on, on this earth. God the Son submits to the Father's will in, in understanding that it's the Father who puts these things under his feet. God the Holy Spirit submits to, to doing his work after Jesus, primarily after Jesus has ascended uh, to, to the Father. And, but clearly we know he is at work before that. But we see an order and a distinctness to their roles, but not subjection in the form that one is greater than than the other we're talking about the godhead three and one perfectly equal perfectly distinct carrying out their roles okay so that that's what that's what he's that's what he's getting at here that's what he's talking about in verses uh, 27 and 28 now as we move on to verse 29 we're going to cover a long section here, verses 29 through 49, where, where Paul is fleshing out this idea um, later on uh, of, of the dead, what happens when we die. Um, but first, in verses uh, 29 through 34, he, 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 he goes back a little bit. It's as if, and, and Paul does this sometimes, he, he, sometimes he's, as he's moved by God to, to write, to write these letters, these many letters that he's written, um, 
Paul kind of, he, he, he gets to writing, you know, he, he just, he just get, gets to rolling here. And, and it's just kind of stream of consciousness almost is what it seems like. And we get to one of these points in verse 29. We get to verse 29, and it's as if Paul says, and come to think of it, and he goes back to what, he was talk, to what we were studying last week, you know, if the resurrection is false. See what I'm saying? In, in verse 29, he says, otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? Why are we also in danger every hour? I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me if the dead are not raised? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought, and stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So, so you see there, he, he's going back to the, to the thought process of, if the resurrection is false, then why are people being baptized in view of death? That's, that's really the, the better way to translate that. If, if the resurrection is false, why, why am I putting myself out here and others putting myself out here dying daily and putting myself in danger daily? Why don't we just eat, drink, and be merry and call it a day and call it a life? It says, if the resurrection is false. It, so he's going back to that, and, and that's what he's getting at here. Now, this, the, the first thing that he talks about, this, the, the people being baptized for the dead. Now, the Mormons have, have built a whole religion on, or part of their religion on this idea. Some, some people on, on the false understanding of what Paul is getting at here. Okay? So, you see, the Mormons um, believe that someone died a hundred years ago. Maybe it's a long-lost family member of yours. And, you know, through the years, maybe, maybe the family lawyer has been, boy, that, that guy, was, he was a wild cat, you know? He, he was out there. There's no way he's in heaven. So the Mormons believe that, hey, if that was your great-great-grandfather and he was a wild cat, and family lore has that he was a wild cat. Well, guess what? I can be baptized for him today. And he'll be saved. That's crazy, isn't it? We don't see anything like that anywhere else in Scripture. We, we, don't, we don't see any talk of that anywhere. So that can't be what Paul means here. It's not consistent with the rest of Scripture. It's just not consistent with the rest of Scripture. So I, I believe that what he has in mind here is, is, is that... This should be translated, perhaps it could be translated better, but the idea is, you know, as we are baptized, we are baptized, we are baptized with death in view. We talk about that whenever we baptize people here, don't we? We talk about the fact that we are buried with him in baptism and raised to walk in the newness of life. We, we understand that, that, that in baptism, there is, there is this picture of, of death. The, the staying with the, the compare and contrast that, that Paul has used with the first Adam and the second Adam. The, the first me is buried. The first you is buried, is, is put to death spiritually and raised. The second me, the second you. The, the one who will, who will live forever. And, and so we understand that that, that actual baptism, that, that, that's not magical, that's not, that doesn't do anything for us, but it is a, it's a picture. It's a picture of what happens. And, but, but Paul is saying, if the resurrection is false, why do we even do that? Why, why do we even do that? Why do we even celebrate and embrace this as an ordinance of the church if the resurrection is false? If the resurrection is false, he goes on to say, you, you, why are we baptizing people if the resurrection is false? Why am I putting myself out there every day? Why am I witnessing to people? Why are we feeding that JV football team? Why are we collecting canned goods to take to the, to the Baptist children's homes? Why are we evangelizing? Why are we doing anything that amounts to anything for the kingdom if the resurrection is false? He says, let's just eat, drink, and be merry. Let's, let's, let's seize the day and live for ourselves. We'll talk about that more in just a moment. But, but that's what he's getting at here in, in, in this kind of, and come to think of it, that he takes us back to if the resurrection is false. But then down in, in verse 35, he, he continues with this thought now, or starts this thought of, what about 
the dead people who are raised. Verse 35 says, But someone will say, How are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? Now, that, that's a legitimate question, isn't it? That, that's something that, that you and I, we want to know this. The, these are some of the things that we're curious about, that people are always curious about. Well, how will it, how will it happen? What will they look like? What, what will be the deal? What kind of body is it? Verse 36, he says, You fool! That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men, and another flesh of beasts, and another flesh of birds, and another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one, and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for stars differ from star in glory. Again, you might read that and you're like, okay, again, what is he talking about here? What is he getting at here? Paul is trying to draw us to an analogy here to help us understand our current bodies and our resurrection bodies. And he uses the analogy, the illustration of planting a seed. He talks about wheat or barley, or maybe you think about a bulb. You, you plant a, a tulip bulb. Someone was talking, I think Ms. Edger was talking about planting some tulips. You were talking about that, weren't you, Ms. Edger? Yeah, she doesn't remember. But. <laughs> <laughs> so planting some bulb. You put a bulb in the ground, and that bulb would, see, well, yeah, would seem to be lifeless, but there's something in it, right? From that bulb, it's a tulip bulb. And what sprouts from it in the spring but a flower? A flower. So that bulb and that flower, they look different, don't they? They, they, look, they look very different from each other. But in identity, what kind of flower is that? Tulip. What kind of bulb is it? Tulip. So its identity is the same. It hasn't, it hasn't changed who it is, but it looks a whole lot different. And he used, that, he used that illustration with wheat or with barley. You plant, you plant the seed of wheat, you plant the seed of barley, and up from the ground comes something that looks entirely different. And that's what he's saying about, that's his answer to the question of, of, of our resurrection bodies. That's, here's some insight we can get into. It, it might not satisfy you completely about what your body's going to be like, what, what it's going to look like, but one thing you can know is that your essence, it's going to still be you. But guess what? You're going to be different. We're going to be different. I can't explain to you, you know, we, we, all of uh, how different we're going to be. Some things we pick up on in the scriptures, is, you know, we, we, we see and read some, some promises of, uh, never growing old again. Uh, we won't grow tired. We won't get sick. Uh, we won't cry. There no more tears. Uh, we won't go hungry. We won't be thirsty. So th there, there's some, some tidbits and hints we can get about some of the, the, the interaction. We can, you know, Jesus was able just to, uh, you know, walk through a wall and, and be in a room. Perhaps that, that will be the same type of resurrection bodies th that we have. I, I, I don't know that you can necessarily say that for sure, um, but perhaps we can, we can uh, think that way. But we can know from what we read here that we will, same essence, you know, you'll still be Stan and Melissa and Charlotte and Kim. You'll still be that person. You'll still be who you are, but you will be different. You'll be different. Whether that's a completely different look, I, I, I don't know. Will we be able to identify each other? You might know who you are, but well, I know who you are. I, in, the, in the same way that we know each other on this earth, I, I don't know. I suspect we'll know each other because we'll be in, in perfect and full fellowship, but it will be different for sure. Now, in verses 42 through 49, he, he just kind of continues this line of thinking. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. So here's a part one of the differences. 
It's imperishable when we're resurrected. Uh, it is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. Again, there's an order to, to what we're talking about. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we also uh, bear the image of the heavenly. And so here, you know, uh, just all, all the, the differences that, that he talks about there, you know, we're, we're earthy now, but then we will bear the image of the heavenly. So, you know, as you think about that, that's where you can kind of start thinking about, you know, what would be like Jesus and be able to appear here, appear there, perhaps as we carry on uh, his, his image, the image of the heavenly. So these are some of the insights we can get and that Paul gives about the resurrection bodies. Now, we move down to verse 50. We continue this, this thought uh, and the, this, this, this process that he's in about change. Now, verse 50 says, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. So uh, here he continues that thought, we, we, we've got to be changed. Here, here's one of the things about, about being changed, is that it has to happen, because uh, the perishable, you, you can't take a perishable body and go to an imperishable place. You've got to have an, an imperishable body here. And so this is important for us, I think. This is one of those things where, where it's important to think about um, the fact that God's not taking. I, I, think, I think this is one of those things. People will, will debate this, I'm sure, and that's fine. But I think we can understand from this that God is not necessarily taking what's, what's left out there in the graveyard when Jesus <laughs> returns. He's not necessarily taking, what, taking that and says, oh boy, there's not much to work with here. Let me reconstruct what I can. Okay? Boy, this guy, over 300 years, this guy's really withered away. There's not much here. I, I read, you've heard of Roger Williams? Just read this yesterday. Roger Williams was a guy that the Puritan that uh, one of the founders of Rhode Island. And several years, I think hundreds of years, after his death, they, had, they, they dug up his, his casket because they were going to have to move it. And as they were digging, guess what they discovered? A nearby apple tree. The roots from that apple tree had grown into his casket. Grown into his casket. So when you're eating apples from that tree, you're eating a piece of Roger Williams. Right. So, so what? My goodness, what's God going to do with that? You know, God's not reconstructing; He's resurrecting. He's resurrecting, and we're, He's not giving us the same body. It's not going to be perishable; it's imperishable, and, and that's that's the point that that Paul is making here. We will be changed, changed. And now, here's an important thing for us. This change that we're talking about, this change, it's important that we as Christians understand that this change is not just something that we look forward to. It's not a change that just impacts our eternity. It's a change, friends. It's a future change. It's a promise of change that should impact our today. It should impact our today. Because just as Paul earlier was talking about, well, hey, if the resurrection is false, then let's eat, eat, drink, and be merry. Let's not worry about anything. But it's not false. It is true. And because we know we will be changed then, we should understand that we are changed now. 
You see, the promise of this resurrection changes our lives, changes our outlooks, changes our attitudes, changes not just our appearance one day, but it changes our heart, it changes our mind, it changes our attitude, it changes, it should change everything about us today. Because you see, God's not, God, God doesn't save us, God doesn't redeem us, God doesn't regenerate us, God doesn't make us new for that life alone, he makes us new for this life. He doesn't make us new to, to accomplish things way out yonder in eternity. He makes us new to accomplish things today. You see, today you and I can recognize that we're walking and living and working and serving in the power of eternity. We're walking and serving and living under that same power. That same God who has the power to give resurrection, that same God has the power to work in your life and my life today. He wants to do that. That's why he dwells in us. He dwells in us today to make us this powerful weapon in his hand, if you will. To make us this powerful tool, this powerful servant. You see, the change is not just about tomorrow. The change is not just about eternity. The change is about today. We live in light of that change. We live today in light of the promise of that change. Because you see in verse 54 it says, But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, this changes the way we're thinking about death. Because the fact is, it doesn't, take, it doesn't take long after you're born, maybe a few years, before you start understanding something about death. And then as you get older, you understand more and more about death. Most of our lives, we end up knowing something about death, don't we? Most of our lives, we, we, we know about death. We know what death is. Not just Christian people. The whole world has an understanding of death and that it's going to happen to them. It's going to happen to them. And what we're talking about here impacts our approach to that. Because, you see, people can know it. And because they know death is going to come and because they think, there's a lot of people that think death's going to come, but after death, after that death, there's nothing. There's nothing. There's nothing. And so they're going to react one of a few ways. One response to that is, is to be reckless. Kind of like Paul suggested here. Say, if, if the resurrection ain't true, if, if I die and pfft, that's it, then eat, drink, and be merry. Go do what you want to do. And that's the way some people approach life. Is this, hey, there, there's, there's nothing after death. I'm just going to live recklessly. But I, I, I think, I don't think that's a majority. I think, I think the majority of people are just kind of, just kind of out here in this place where there's death and, and maybe there's something after, maybe there's not. They're, they're, just, they're just kind of out here. Well, well, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. And the way that impacts your life today, the way that impacts a, a person thinking that way today is to think, well, does it really matter what I do? Does it really matter what choices I make today? I can do this today or I can do that today. There, there, there can be just a, a, an aimless walk through life. No vision, no care, no direction. Just maybe not reckless, but what does the day hold? What does the day hold? Aimless. But for us, when we can say, the, 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 this, this, this wonderful chorus, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your staying? Man, we, we can live our lives in the fullness of knowing that this isn't all there is. That there is an eternity promised to us and we're living on the cusp of it. We're living in the power of it 
even in this day. And, and that's kind of what's summed up here in verse 58. There's certainly here in verse 58 an admonition, uh, a suggested response that Christians should have to the fact and truth of resurrection. He says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. So because resurrection is true, because it is fact, because we are living in the power of it, we can know, we can say, be steadfast, be immovable, be steadfast in the gospel is what he's talking to. Be steadfast in the scriptures, be immovable in the scriptures, be immovable in the gospel, be steadfast and be immovable in the mission, in the mission that God has given us. Go and make disciples. Be steadfast and immovable in those things that we know to be true in the scriptures, those things that we know to be our driving force. Be steadfast and be immovable in those things. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Even, even when there are seasons when it looks like our work is fruitless. Even when there are seasons that we go through as individual Christians and as a church body, when it might seem like, and you might question, boy, are we doing the right thing? Is that the right God to, to lead us? Am I in the right place? Am I in the right church? We are to be steadfast and immovable and always abounding in the work as long as we know that we are doing the work. That we are going out and attempting to make disciples. We want to grow each other. We want to reach the world and make disciples. Then we abound in that no matter what the results look like. As I was talking about earlier, no matter what's going on out in the world, the world is a tougher place. It's tougher and tougher every day. But we've got to abound in the work that the Lord has called us to. It is our great privilege. It is our great privilege to not have to wait for eternity to live in the power of it. It is our great honor. And God has shared and shed some of his glory on us in being image bearers and being able to have imperishable bodies imperishable futures and it's up to us not to wait to live in it but to embrace it and live in it today let's pray Father <clears throat> thank you that uh, not only can we know today that your word is true but that you are true Your resurrection is true. We can know, God, beyond that, that our resurrection is true. Our resurrection is promised. And Father, we're so grateful for that and grateful, God, that that should and hopefully does for all of us, God, impact the way that we live our lives today. Father, I pray that we understand that that, that, that one day, yes, our, our, our physical bodies will be changed. Our resurrected bodies will be different than we are today. And we can look forward to that. But Father, we can also embrace the difference that you've made in us today. Help us to not only embrace it and believe it, but to live in it, God. To live in it and, and impact impact the people around us, whoever you put in our paths for your glory. God, I pray, I pray, Father, that over the coming week, that you'll put someone in the path of every single one of us who hears this today, whether we're hearing this in this place or whether we're listening online, every single believer who hears this, God, I pray that you put someone in our paths that has a question about resurrection this week and that we can answer it, God, with all confidence. And I pray, God, that we will be a people who from this day forward aren't sitting back waiting for opportunities, but that we are, we are understanding, God, that we are living in your resurrection power and to do nothing with it is sinful. Father, I pray. I pray, Father, that we make full use 
of the power that is in us and available to us and we make full use of it, God, for your glory and your glory alone. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.